organize a talk by Dr. Robert Zubrin. He's a very influential figure in uh, generally the field of astronautics and specifically Mars colonization. Uh, so in, in 1996, he uh, published the book called The Case for Mars, where he detailed a new plan for colonizing Mars. And um, uh, he proposed this to the government. However, uh, it wasn't so widely accepted. And thus he started uh, the Mars Society in 1998 and has since then uh, been sharing more and more uh, enthusiasm about coloniz colonizing Mars. We're very happy to have him here. Uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin, uh, would you please present uh, your talk to us today? Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, so um, I'm an astronautical engineer and um, been one for quite a while. Now, in 1989, President um, George Bush, the older, the first one, got up on the steps of the National Air and Space Museum together with uh, Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins, you know, the Apollo um, 11 crew and said, uh, you know, this is the 25th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. That was uh, great. That's what America's all about. And therefore, I, as president, are committing us to go, uh, you know, back to the moon and on to Mars and this time to stay. Um, and so uh, NASA, responding to this imperative, went off and conducted a study on how it might be accomplished. And um, the, they came back with um, a report three months later, which therefore became known as the 90-day report, in which they said, well, we can do it. It will take us 30 years and $400 billion, but we could do it. Here's the plan. First, we're going to build an Earth orbiting space station, and then we're going to augment the space station with giant hangars to do orbital construction and fueling and repair of interplanetary spaceships. And then we're going to use these spaceships to go to lunar orbit and build another space station there. And then we're going to use that to build a lunar base. And then using this infrastructure, we will be able to build giant interplanetary spaceships using nuclear electric propulsion, which will be able to go to Mars orbit, and then we'll have Mars landing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, at this time, I was an engineer working for the uh, Martin Company, and uh, a number of us and I had, um, we had been, um, along with most of the other big aerospace companies, been drafted to you know, provide technical information to support one or another parts of this uh, concept study. And um, we were not happy with it at all. In fact, we went to management and said, look, this is a ridiculous plan. Um, uh, it, it is not a plan to send humans to Mars. This is a plan that is meant to justify all existing NASA technology development programs. In other words, it's um, a, a program, a plan not designed to be as quick and as cheap as possible, but as uh, tedious and as expensive as possible to justify as many expenditures as possible. Um, and if the, the matter is left here, there will be no Mars program because Congress is not going to buy this. And management, um, you know, looked at us and said, you know, we think you're right. Uh, and so they charted a team um, of 12 people drawn from the whole huge Martin company, which was over 100,000 people, but team of 12 um, to come up with an alternative plan. And I was one of the 12. Um, and um, now because there were a lot of creative spirits on this team, we could not agree with each other uh, as to what the best alternative plan was. And so in fact, the team came up with three alternative plans one of which was known as the Mars Direct Plan that I was largely responsible for, along with another engineer named David Baker. And we had a couple of more junior engineers supporting us from outside the team. Um, and management, uh, uncharacteristically, but smartly, um, did not try to reconcile these three plans into a single company uh, line. Uh, rather, uh because and which would have been impossible because the spirit the, the 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 philosophy behind the three different plans were all very different and you, you couldn't have have have, have uh, merged them 
they said, let's just float all three and we'll see which one uh, catches on. And so we did. Uh, in the spring of 1990, we went and briefed various NASA centers. Um, and it rapidly became clear that the Mars Direct Plan, the plan that Baker and I had developed, was the one that uh, was lighting the place on fire and um, had the most potential to break through and change the situation. Um, and the Mars Direct Plan uh, was the most radical break with the characteristic thinking that had dominated Mars mission concept development since uh, Verna von Braun came up with the first plan back in the late 40s. Um, that is the von Braun paradigm, which characterized also the 90-day report and also characterized the other two plans drawn up by the Scenario Development uh, Committee and every plan um, that was put forth by our competitors because the people at Boeing and some other companies also were aware that the NASA plan was ridiculous and something better had to be found. Um, the, 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 all of them followed the von Braun paradigm, which was on-orbit construction of large interplanetary spaceships that would sail from Earth orbit to Mars orbit, carrying with them all the propellant for uh, a return round trip, and then dispatching a small landing craft from Mars orbit to the surface and come back up after a short stay. Instead, Mars Direct was direct launch to Mars, direct return from Mars, no on-orbit assembly, in fact, no on-orbit rendezvous of any kind. Um, use, long duration stays on Mars starting from the very first mission. Use of Martian resources starting on the very first mission. Um, and uh, the latter was the key. The philosophy was travel light, live off the land. Um, the place where we went to for our inspiration was previous human exploration on Earth, where wherever that had been conducted intelligently, that is how it was done. And so the, the issue with Mars is um, Mars exploration can be, you know, why are we going to Mars? Because it's the planet that has the resources to support life and potentially future human civilization. Well, if we take advantage of that, the same materials on Mars that make Mars interesting are also what could make it attainable. And thus we developed the Mars Direct Plan. Now, um, the so the basis was direct launch to Mars. And you had to, in order to do that, you had to have a heavy lift vehicle. Um, now, which did not exist as an operational capability in 1990, but was well within the memory of everybody at that time, namely the Saturn V, uh, which had been flying people to the moon only 18 years before. Um, and uh, what we did was, uh, Unfortunately, the, the various components of the Saturn V were no more in production, but we came up with an alternative, basically duplicating the capability of the Saturn V, um, but using components that were in production in the 90s, namely shuttle technology. And so we developed uh, the concept for a vehicle, which looks an awful lot like the current SLS, okay? And uh, in fact, we had been working on that even before Mars Direct in 1988. Um, I, and Baker and I, and Baker was more important on that particular team, um, developed this concept, which was then called Shuttle Z, uh, and later uh, became known as the Ares in the Mars Direct plan for a shuttle-derived heavy lift vehicle. And the basic idea was we would use four engines instead of three, and we'd put them on the bottom of the external tank get rid of the orbiter, keep the two solids, and then put a hydrogen oxygen upper stage on top of the external tank, and then a big fairing, the eight meter fairing like the Saturn V had, and there you would have it. And this was a Saturn V equivalent vehicle. Um, so yeah, um, the and this vehicle after <laughs> 30, 
four years later actually flew, sort of. Uh, the problem was, first of all, that the development was extended for three decades, which is ridiculous. The Saturn V, uh, the contract to build it was allocated in 1962. It flew in 1967, five years, and it was a far more revolutionary vehicle in its day relative to the technology of the time than the SLS. Um, uh, the SLS is basically a simplified shuttle stack. And so we did not design this with the idea that this would be the greatest launch vehicle. It was the idea that this would be a quick and dirty way to create a heavy lift launch vehicle and have it flying by, you know, 1994. And if it had been developed, then the past quarter century, we would have had that capability. We could have done all sorts of things, including human Mars and moon missions and many other things of its arrival on the scene now. Um, it's kind of like as if the British had developed the Spitfire, but not in time for the Battle of Britain, but in time for uh, today. Um, and it would arrive in the world, uh, it was wonderful 1940s fighter aircraft in a world that had passed it by. Um, the, 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 so, uh, yeah, I've got very mixed feelings about the recent launch. The other problem with the SLS that flew uh, last year is that they did not have a proper stage on it. Um, that is, it needed, it, in order to duplicate the capability of a Saturn V, the upper stage needs at least 250,000 pounds of thrust, which was the thrust of the J2 engine that powered the, um, the third stage of the Saturn V. Um, NASA, amazingly, in the past decade, it, it could not reproduce the J2, and they ended up putting a, a number of RL-10 engines with, you know, 15,000 pounds thrust each on that upper stage. So it's greatly underpowered. And this um, cuts the capability from Saturn V class to about two thirds Saturn V class of the current SLS. But anyway, heavy lift launch vehicle, whether you drive a shuttle derived launch vehicle or you recreate the Saturn V or you use Starship, that's what you need. You need something that can lift um, enough payload to orbit to shoot off to Mars, a payload of around 40 tons on a direct trajectory to Mars, okay? And then the, what we would do is um, the, the payload that we would shoot to Mars first would be the Earth return vehicle. Let me see something here. I, I can't seem to find my original Mars direct charts, but I have uh, some charts from the more recent uh, period. Uh, this will do. It's great. Okay. I got some charts. All right. So can someone allow me to share the screen? You right. should have, you should be able to do it now. I think oh, I've made you. Right, our share. Okay, you have to forgive me on this. I'm not from this time period and I'm not acquainted with. Wow. All right, so, so this is the 90-day report concept, giant interplanetary spaceship about the size of an Imperial Star Destroyer constructed on orbit at orbiting spaceports. Um, it's quite big. You can see Mars is there for scale. Um, okay, also they had an argument that you couldn't go to Mars until we had a base on the moon to practice for Mars. Now, we should practice for Mars before we go to Mars, but we could do it on Earth and you, in fact, the Mars Society has built practice Mars exploration bases in the Arctic and in the desert. Um, and they're as good for practicing Mars missions as the moon is. Um, so we need um, heavy lift. Okay. And of course, this was not science fiction. Saturn V would do the trick. Shuttle derived would do the trick. Starship will do the trick. Um, so here's the basic mission uh, plan. Um, 
in the first year of active operation to use one of these heavy lifters to shoot off to Mars an unmanned payload weighing around 40 metric ta tons. And it flies straight out to Mars on a minimum energy trajectory, it takes eight months to get there, and then it uses that aero shield that you see uh, to um, capture from interplanetary orbit into Mars orbit. And then after we check it out and make sure the weather is good, we then direct it to go deeper into the Martian atmosphere. The aeroshell is used to plow us down to subsonic speeds. Then we pop a parachute, and which puts us down uh, much slower, and then finally do terminal landing with uh, rockets, just like we did with the Viking mission in um, 1976. So what's this thing we've landed on? Mars? Um, the main thing is um, an Earth return vehicle. Okay, once again, no one's in it at this point, uh, but it's got, uh, it's a little rocket ship. It's got a cab in here, uh, the five and a half meters tall, five meters in diameter, two decks, sufficient tight quarters for a crew of four for a six month voyage from Mars to Earth, although no one is in it now. And then below that, you've got two methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages. Um, however, they are unfueled. However, in, in the little tank, uh, in the lower stage, in tanks that are later going to contain methane, we've got about six tons of liquid hydrogen, probably in gel form. And then slung below the vehicle, not shown in this diagram, we got a light truck, like a little pickup truck. And in the back of the truck is a little nuclear reactor with a power of 100 kilowatts. Now the truck is telerobotically driven a few hundred meters away from the lander, and then the reactor is put down on the ground, preferably in a little crater or a ditch, but in anything uh, on the reverse side of the hill, to uh, anything to put uh, uh, a um, nice chunk of dirt between the reactor and the main landing area for shielding. Then we turn the reactor on. And then what we do is we've got power at the ship. We run a pump. We suck in the Martian air which is mostly carbon dioxide, 95% carbon dioxide. Uh, we can react that with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst. It will go to methane and water. The methane's our fuel. We store that in our tank. The water we take, we split into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygens are oxidized, so we keep that. The hydrogen we recycle to make more methane. And then finally, um, to get additional oxygen, we got a third reactor which just breaks down CO2 into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And actually a reactor of this kind uh, has been successfully tested on the Perseverance rover. Um, and we keep the oxygen and discard the carbon monoxide. Uh, you can do that on Mars. There's no EPA there. And uh, when you're all done, you've turned uh, the six tons of hydrogen from Earth into 108 tons of methane oxygen uh, by propellant for use on the surface of Mars. 96 of that 108 is for the Earth return vehicle. It powers the return trip. Uh, the other 12 is for surface vehicles to give you much greater mobility than you could ever get with batteries. Um, and that's also an essential part of the mission because we're going to Mars to explore. And the key capability required for exploration is mobility. And so the point is the ability to make use of local resources or rather turn local materials into resources um, is key not only to making the mission cheap, it's also the key to making the mission effective, which is equally important because there's no point going to Mars unless you can do something effective when you get there. Okay, so, and um, we actually built a test unit that does this at Martin, that's me in 1993. Um, so now you've got a fully fueled, uh, Earth return vehicle sitting waiting for you on the surface of Mars. That being the case at the next launch window, and you can launch to Mars every 26 months, roughly every two years, we launch two more rockets. One shoots out another one of the Earth return vehicle fuel factory packages. The other shoots out a Habitat spacecraft with a crew of uh, four astronauts in it. Now, because we have our return ride waiting for us on the surface of Mars. We do not need to fly to Mars in an Imperial Star Destroyer um, or even a comparatively modest Millennium Falcon. We can fly to Mars in a tuna can. Um, now, the tuna can here is a little larger than the one you buy a tuna in at the store. Um, this is about eight meters in diameter. 
and um, about six meters tall. So it's got two decks, each with three meters of headroom. The upper deck is where the people live. The lower deck is more of a cargo hold workshop kind of place. Here's one potential layout of the upper deck of the HAB. You see there's a little stateroom for each of the four astronauts. There's a science lab, an exercise area, a galley. And in the center there, what you see is the solar flare storm shelter. Actually, I would prefer to put that shelter on the lower deck, but putting it on the upper deck keeps the lower deck completely clear. And so you can have larger objects there like um, ground rovers. Um, anyway, the solar flare storm shelter is important. There, there's two kinds of radiation that can get you in interplanetary space, and they're entirely different in character from each other. One is the solar flares, and these are events that come from the sun, and they come uh, unpredictably. You might have a probability of having one big one per year, but you could have two in the same month and then nothing for three years. You're more likely to get them during solar max than solar min, but um, Basically, they could happen any time, and the the and you're probably going to experience one or possibly two in the course of the mission because we're going to be in space for a year. We're going to be six months out, six months back. We're going to be on the Martian surface for a year and a half, but the, actually, the Martian atmosphere, as thin as it is, is thick enough to mask out solar flares. So, but it's in space where we're vulnerable, and so we're likely to be hit by a solar flare. And the thing about a solar flare is, if you have no shielding. It can deliver thousands of REMS, um, tens of sieverts of um, radiation dose in a very short period of time, which is enough to kill. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that the type of radiation that they are is protons with energies on the order of a million volts. And that kind of stuff can be stopped by 12 centimeters of water shielding or uh, things that from the point of view of radiation are essentially the same thing as water, such as food, or uh, things that water and food become as the mission proceeds. And we have enough of those materials on board the ship. We have enough provisions, and the provisions then turn to waste, which are still good for shielding, to pack it in around a small central area in the center of the ship. And if a solar flare happens, the alarm bell rings and everybody goes in there and they're packed in pretty tight for four or five, six hours until it's all over, the all clear rings and we come out. And that's it. And that's how we're safe from the solar flares. Um, solar flares were a terror for Apollo because those were short duration missions. They weren't going to the moon with tons of food to shield themselves with. And they were simply counting on uh, luck that in a mission, a round trip mission of a week, there probably wouldn't be a major solar flare. And in fact, there wasn't. And so they were fine. But if it had hit, they, they would have been in trouble. Um, but the odds of it hitting were about 2%. And they were willing to risk that. But on Mars, precisely because it's a long duration mission and we've got lots of provisions, uh, we can use those provisions as shielding against solar flares. Now, the other kind of radiation is cosmic rays or galactic cosmic rays, as they're sometimes called. Now, these are particles that do not come from the sun. In fact, it's not really well understood where they do come from, uh, but or even how they could exist, but they do. And they particles that come zipping into our solar system from interstellar space with energies not of millions of volts each, um, which is uh, but billions of volts each. And the reason why it's hard to understand that is because the characteristic uh, energy of nuclear fusion reactors is millions of volts, not billions of volts. So it's not clear how you can create billion volt particles, but they're real. And they would rip right through 12 centimeters of water. Uh, you need meters of shielding to block them. On Earth, most of them are blocked out because we've got the equivalent of 10 meters of water over our head in the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, a few of them still get to the ground, but not many. Um, so we cannot afford that much mass on a spaceship. Can't. So we're going to take the dose. That's the bad news. The good news is that the magnitude of the cosmic ray dose is only about half a sievert per year, 50 rems per year of radiation. And in this case, it would be scattered across a two and a half year period. In other words, it's not a 
sudden dose like the solar flare is all happening within hours. This is pitter patter of, of radiation over a two and a half year period, which is much less dangerous. Um, generally with any toxin, chemical or otherwise, for instance, alcohol, um, you know, if you drank a, a glass of wine every day for a year, it wouldn't affect your health at all. If you drank 365 glasses of wine in one night, it would kill you. So spacing out the radiation over two and a half years gives the time for the body to recover. And in fact, if, even if this dose was a, a relatively short term, uh, 50 rems half a sievert would represent about a 1% risk of getting a fatal radiation uh, disease at some time later in life to a 35-year-old woman. It would take about 80 rems to represent the same amount of risk to a man because the woman has the extra risk of uh, breast cancer. Um, if the person's older, the risk is lower. If the risk is younger, the risk is higher. But we're talking about a, a, a risk on the order of 1%. And once again, not during the mission, but at some time later in your life. And to put that in perspective, the average American has a 20% chance they're going to die of cancer if they're a non-smoker. If they're a smoker, it's 40%. This would make it 21. So in fact, if we recruited the crew out of smokers and sent them to Mars without their tobacco, we would be significantly reducing their chance of getting cancer because the radiation risk is much lower than the smoking risk. Um, and just so you know, um, there actually have been uh, a fair number of astronauts and cosmonauts who have put in long stays on either the International Space Station or the Mir or Salyut Space Stations. And um, they have taken cosmic ray doses comparable to what you would get going to Mars and back. And there have been no radiological casualties at all. Okay. Nor would you expect there to be. If you've got 10 people and each have a 1% chance risk, you probably would expect zero casualties. And that's what we've seen. Um, now, there is another health effect in space that we have um, seen um, have effect. And that is zero gravity. Uh, zero gravity doesn't kill you, but it weakens you. Uh, it thins out the bones, thins out the muscles. Now, it's entirely survivable. The space station operates in zero gravity, and the standard tour on the space station is six months, which is how long it would take to fly from Earth to Mars. Um, but it does weaken you. And the Mars activity uh, on the surface is field exploration. And, you know, hiking around in a spacesuit is, is a physical activity, and you don't want to decondition the crew if you want them to be effective. Once again, effectiveness is what this is all about. Um, and so uh, I believe we should have artificial gravity on the way to Mars. And the way we can create that is by having the spacecraft, which you see the tuna can shaped spacecraft over there on the right. On the left is the upper stage of the Ares that threw it to Mars. So that's going to Mars too. We tether off of it. We use it as a counterweight, spin this thing up at one RPM. 1.5 kilometer long tether, we can get Mars gravity. If the tether was a bit longer or if we spun it faster, we could create Earth gravity. Um, and this avoids uh, the deconditioning of the crew. It also makes a lot of things easier. You can cook in conventional ways uh, if you have gravity because the water stays in the ponds that are starting to float all over the camp. Um, and um, so it, it's a big convenience actually to have gravity. Zero gravity is an interesting novelty. Um, but it gets old. Um, so we fly out to Mars. Now, I mentioned this is a six-month transit. The minimum energy transit is eight months. But if we put on a little extra uh, gas, we can get there in six months without too much of a mass penalty. Um, if you try to get there faster than that, the mass penalty starts going exponential. So six months is a very good compromise between uh, duration and mass. Uh, but also, why six months? Why not 5.8 or 6.1? From the point of view of mass, those would uh, clearly be uh, comparable. But there's another factor. 
which is the six month trajectory to Mars is also the free return trajectory. That is, it is the trajectory that if you decide to abort and not go to Mars and fly past Mars, you go looping out to about two astronomical units away from the sun and you come back around and you get back to Earth's orbit exactly two years after you left. So the Earth is there to meet you and you can go home. If you tried to get to Mars faster, you'd end up looping out further and you'd get to Earth's orbit more than two years after you left and you would miss the bus. If you go slower, you get there for before Earth and you miss the bus. So the six month orbit is the magic orbit. It's the safest orbit. So um, I, I do not agree with the people who say we got to have uh, more advanced propulsion so we can get to Mars faster. I don't want to get to Mars faster. Uh, if I had a more advanced propulsion system, like, for instance, nuclear thermal rockets, I would use it to increase the payload while still getting to Mars in six months. Okay, And in fact, it can easily be shown with risk studies that, uh, you know, if you can double the payload by going there in five months instead of six, you know, you can make your life support system quadruply redundant. Uh, you can do all sorts of things uh, that um, make the mission safer. Um, you know, by having a, a more backed up life support system, for example, uh, on a slightly longer duration. And of course, preserving the free return is very important. Um, so we get out there on a six month orbit. We get close to Mars, we fire a pyrotechnic that cuts the cable, and then we go arrow breaking into Mars orbit. So we're briefly in the zero gravity condition. And then we go and land at landing site number one, where the fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for us. Um, Okay, now, uh, if we're off course by tens of kilometers or even 100 kilometers, we have a pressurized rover in the lower deck of our hab that could take us to the Earth return vehicle and accomplish a surface rendezvous. In other words, if you've got a vehicle, then the surface rendezvous, unlike a space rendezvous, space rendezvous has got to be precise. If you're off by the slightest amount, you're completely off. If you're off by a kilometer in a surface rendezvous, you just drive over there. If you're off by 100 kilometers, you just drive over there. Now, if you're off by thousands of kilometers, you can't drive over there, but we got the second Earth return vehicle following us out to Mars. And if we land on the wrong side of the planet, we can still bring that one to land near us. Okay, so that's a th the third level backup. And finally, is a fourth level backup we got the whole crew landed on Mars where they've got natural gravity, where they have substantial radiation protection offered by the Martian environment, and they have enough supplies with them to last for three years. So if we can't land accurately, if we can't land within driving range, if we can't use the second Earth return vehicle, we can still just tough it out on the surface of Mars until the next launch window and more supplies and another Earth return vehicle can be fired out to us then. So it's a four layer defense in depth on the mission in addition to the abort option of the free return. So it's, it's substantially backed up. Furthermore, when we're on Mars in the baseline plan here, we actually have three habitable cabins, the big one in the uh, habitat module itself and the two smaller cabins in the two Earth return vehicles because we're going to land the second Earth return vehicle probably at a new place but within driving range because it will define the location of the next exploration missions. So this is the plan. Two launches every two years is average of one per year. When we were launching shuttles, when the shuttle was in business, we averaged six a year. So this would represent, um, you know, one sixth of our heavy lift launch capability of a serious uh, uh, program. So we could be doing the moon, asteroids, lots of other things at the same time. We don't have to sacrifice the whole rest of the space program to do humans to Mars. Okay. So this is um, an actual photograph of the Mars base sent back from the future. Um, so here uh, you can see the components of the mission. Um, the Earth return vehicle is the conical vehicle over here on the right. The tuna can shaped hab the crew flies out to Mars in on the left. The reactor in the crater in the background, the pressurized rover in the center here. Uh, some solar panels over on the left as backup, backup power. If we have, have turned the reactor off, we also can run the engine of the car as backup power and also maybe hard to see, but on the far right in the shadow of the Earth return vehicle is the light truck that was used to uh, deploy the reactor that's still around. It can be used as an unpressurized vehicle and as a backup for the pressurized rover. And in the foreground, you see an inflatable greenhouse 
that is not a mission critical element. That's an experiment in growing crops on Martian soil and Martian gravity, Martian water, Martian sunlight for the benefit of future missions and future settlers. Um, okay, so we're going to be on Mars for a year and a half uh, before the launch window opens up to go back to Earth. Okay, and once again, the six-month trajectory is what's known as a conjunction class trajectory. It gets you there in six months. Uh, it can get you home in six months, but there's a year and a half gap between the launch window out and the launch window back. But that makes sense. If you're going to spend a year in transit, you might as well spend something like a year there. You don't want to spend the majority of your mission in transit. And the conjunction mission, which is the basis of the Von Braun plan and the 90-day report, and also, unfortunately, NASA's current uh, mission plan that they've reverted to, spends 95% of the mission time in transit, only 5% on Mars. Um, it, it has no coherent objectives. In this plan, we're spending 60% of our mission time on Mars instead of 5%, 40% in transit. Um, because this is a purpose-driven mission. It's not a um, vendor-driven mission or a flags and footprints mission. Uh, the goal is exploration. Now, what are we exploring Mars for? Uh, we certainly want to explore it for resources for future settlement. Um, and we also want to know a variety of scientific questions are related to uh, you know, geophysics and aeronomy and this and that. Uh, but the central question that is of great interest to really any thinking person relating to Mars or should be is the question of life on Mars. Okay, past, present, well, and future. Uh, but let's deal with past and present. The early Mars was um, uh, really a lot like the early Earth. Uh, that is, three and a half billion years ago, the Earth and Mars both had thick carbon dioxide atmospheres. They both had the right temperatures for liquid water. And we can see the results of liquid water action on Mars in many, many photographs. And this, these are Viking photographs this is from 1976. So you can see uh, large river networks that once existed on Mars. And uh, all the data since this time has reinforced the interpretation of an early warm, wet Mars um, and aqueous environment. Um, CO2 dominated uh, atmosphere as the early Earth had. Earth did not have an oxygen dominated atmosphere until photosynthetic plants converted our atmosphere from CO2 to oxygen, um, which really started happening around 3 billion years ago and wasn't really um, dominant until 2 billion years ago. Um, but um, so life on Earth evolved in this environment. If the theory is correct that life should evolve as a natural promise, a process of complexification of chemistry under these conditions, then it should have appeared on Mars too, although not necessarily identical forms. Okay, there is a good a priori argument you can make that life should be based on carbon and water because of their unique chemical versatility. Uh, but all life on Earth is much more, uh, is uses RNA and DNA, which is a very specific carbon-based alphabet. Um, and you know, on Earth, uh, different countries, um, well, okay, we English speakers use the same alphabet as the French and the Germans and the Poles. It's all Latin alphabet, but the Chinese use a totally different alphabet. And, um, but it accomplishes the same things, even though it, it not only is different letters, it works on an entirely different set of principles, ultimately based on pictures and set of sounds. Nevertheless, you can write books in it. So life needs an information system, but it doesn't necessarily have to be DNA and RNA. So by going to Mars, we can not only discover if uh, life is a general phenomenon in the universe, but if life as we know it on Earth is what life is, or if we're just one particular example drawn from a much vaster tapestry of possibilities. And I, I should add that if we do discover a different information system used by Martian life, um, that is not just a, a philosophical interest, it could have practical interest because you know, biotechnology is going to be one of the principal revolutionary technologies of the 21st century. 
uh, biotechnology is self-replicating nanomachines in reality. We're learning to read the code, we're learning to write the code, but it could be that different operating systems have uh, different capabilities, just as, you know, the earliest computers on earth used the gears and rotors and Babbage machines, and then we had um, electrical relays, and then you know, ferrite cores and silicon cores. And now people are working on quantum computers and, and yeah, DNA computers. And um, who knows, right? So um, th th it could have revolutionary implications for technology if we can discover different operating systems uh, that could support uh, self-replicating organisms, um, different programmable capabilities that those offer. Um, so going to be on Mars for a year and a half. At the end of the year and a half, we get in the Earth return vehicle, we start up, we fly back to Earth. We leave the habitat behind on Mars, the reactor, the vehicles, all this stuff. We leave it behind because now it becomes available to future crews. So after we've done a number of these missions, you can see here is a, a map of Mars. Uh, Texas is there for scale. You can see Mars is a lot bigger than Texas. Um, and one of these circles represents, if you had a landing at the center of them, that's about the territory you could explore given the ground vehicles that we're providing. So it's a pretty substantial area. It's comparable in size to Texas, comparable in size to France, if you will. Um, uh, and, and, but after you fly a certain number of these missions, we're gonna know the answer of whether life ever appeared on Mars uh, and what its characteristic forms were or are if they survive, because we're looking for fossils of life on the surface, but there's liquid water underground on Mars. And if we have humans there, we can drill down uh, within a kilometer of the surface, there's liquid water. And if there's ever was life on Mars, I, I'm convinced it's still there in that water, just as the Earth's most primitive life forms that can no longer live at the Earth's surface because it's been oxygenated can still be found in the groundwater of the Earth. Um, so we're going to have the answers to these scientific questions. And now the real question with Mars is going to be not, was there, is there life on Mars? It's going to be, will there be life on Mars? Can we settle Mars? And to determine the answer to that, we need a Martian base, which we can initially construct just by landing a bunch of HABs all in the same area and mating them up. Later on, we can build underground vaults comparable to subway systems, create large pressurized volumes uh, to create not merely bases, but uh, human settlements and beginnings of a new branch of human civilization. Um, and there's a lot more I could say about that other than, uh, well, I believe that that civilization someday will then take the next step and actually terraform Mars because humans are life and it's the nature of life to improve its environment, to make it more favorable for life. And so it'd be basically unnatural if once you there are human settlers on Mars, they did not transform Mars. Um, much as uh, life on Earth has transformed the Earth to make it more favorable to life, radically so. Um, so there we have it. And I guess I only have 10 minutes for questions. So I'll stop it there and take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Um, I'll let that do it. Yeah. run the questions. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dr. Zubrin. We really enjoyed that. So, um, We'll start with in the room, and if there are people online, then please put the questions in that. Um, anyone have any questions here? Um, I could start us off with one. So, um, Dr. Zubrin, what do you think is the role of um, asteroid mining in Mars colonization? Do you think it's necessary or not necessary at all? Uh, I think that asteroid mining uh, will greatly help Mars colonization. Look, you know, you know how to make money off of the gold rush? By, you do it by selling blue jeans to miners. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, that, you know, the people who actually go out prospecting for gold, some find it, they're winners, some don't, they're losers. The people who sell them the mining equipment and to give them the uh, supplies they need to go about mining always win. And that's why, you know, we had the gold rush in California and the miners are long gone. San Francisco is still there. And people around the world still wear this emblematic American product known as blue jeans, which in fact was, was invented as a product to give durable pants to California gold miners in 1849. Um, and here I'm living in Denver, actually live in Golden, which was 
a gold uh, rush town and Denver was a gold rush town. The mining's long gone. The cities are still here. Uh, Mars has an enormous positional advantage in supporting asteroid mining compared to the Earth, about a hundredfold. Uh, I go through this, actually, I've got two books. Um, of course, my best known book is The Case for Mars, and there's a latest edition here uh, with a little endorsement from Elon Musk on the cover. It discusses this, how uh, Mars becomes the essential uh, base for supporting asteroid mining. And then also I have a, a, an, another book called The Case for Space, which discusses this as well and has a whole chapter on the asteroid mining. Um, the, um, but, um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, so it's kind of a triangle trade. Or um, if you go earlier in history, the uh, colonies that actually made money for the British in the New World were the sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Um, however, the 13 colonies that eventually became America uh, were places, were much more complete societies than these Caribbean plantation islands. And they could make all kinds of things that were needed in those islands that the islands couldn't make for themselves. Um, everything from craft goods to all sorts of staple crops and you name it, um, we had the capability to do it. And we were much closer to the islands than England was. So the way this worked, even though the those sorts of goods that we could make here were of no interest in England, which was more advanced industrially than the 13 colonies. Nevertheless, um, we could sell those things in the Caribbean. The Caribbean, supported by that, could sell sugar to England or molasses for rum. Um, and uh, so they would get cold cash from the British, which they could pay to us for our stuff. And then we could use that cash to buy the more advanced industrial goods from England, as known as the triangle trade. So uh, what I see is the triangle trade involving the asteroids uh, will benefit the Mars colonies in the same way as the triangle trade involving the sugar plantations benefited the uh, 13 American colonies. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a question from Jaden on the chat. Um, to what extent is exploration on Mars improved by having humans as opposed to using rovers, which don't require a life support system, et cetera? Uh, about three orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, I can say that both in terms, because we've done studies ourselves involving using robots, even telerobots with zero time delays to try to do exploration in the desert near our Mars as a research station compared to what human astronauts could do. And also uh, Stephen Squires, who was the principal investigator of the Spirit and Opportunity missions and who is a field geologist himself, has said publicly that there's nothing that those rovers could do that he could not do if he was there in one one thousandth the time. And there are any number of things that he could do that they couldn't do at all. And um, uh, I would say, by the way, our Mars as a research station, in one of our initial missions, while we were in sim exploring in spacesuits, we found a dinosaur fossil, which has uh, since been followed up by professional paleontologists and led to the largest uh, dinosaur fossil find in North America in 50 years. Um, I was there that day when we found that fossil. And no uh, robotic rover could even have gotten to the place where we found it, let alone, or had found it if it had somehow magically gotten there. Um, and, you know, I mean, I live here in Colorado, which is a place that's famous for uh, dinosaur uh, fossils. And I, I could tell you, you could parachute a hundred robotic rovers into the Rocky Mountains here. You would never find a dinosaur fossil. It takes rock hounds out there, hiking long distances through unimproved terrain, doing heavy work, digging, pickaxe work, delicate work, you know, splitting open shales sideways to reveal what's pasted between the pages of the rock, um, following up intuitive clues. That's what's needed to find the, the, the fossils. And so, um, I'm all in favor of robotic missions, uh, so long as they're the best we can do. Um, and I also favor robotic augmentation to human explorers, such as aerial drones. We could use 
uh, drone helicopters of the of ingenuity type to greatly uh, um, enhance human exploration capabilities, much as reconnaissance drones are used to support uh, infantry and so forth in the military situations uh, here on Earth. Um, but the, compared to what human, ex there's no comparison between a, a robotic rover on the ground and a human explorer on the ground. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. So, um... Yeah, we'll take this one. What advice would you give an aspiring space engineer based in the UK? Well, first of all, um, get an engineering degree. Um, the um, Look, there's something that I go into a lot in, in the case for space, but people, I think, are aware of it. If you're following the news, they've got this entrepreneurial space revolution right now of uh, private companies breaking into the space business okay, spearheaded by SpaceX, of course, but the, the, the cheaper launch has gotten, the more opportunities there are for various business plans involving activities in space to be um, profitable. Uh, and the more of them that get launched, the more launches there are, the more opportunities for launch companies to be profitable and also make launch even cheaper because more launches. Um, the, uh, you know, if, if you are a technical person who is capable of getting an engineering degree, it can be an aerospace degree, but frankly, and that's a very good one, uh, but there are plenty of engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, even chemical engineers uh, who are involved in, in uh, space companies because um, those disciplines are all necessary. Um, but even if you're not the engineering type, um, if you're the business type, find some friends who are engineers and you can do a startup uh, if you can come up with a business plan for some activity that could be done in space much more cheaply than it's currently being done. Um, and there are many of these startups going on. Um, the Finally, if you're neither the business type nor the uh, engineering type, if you're the liberal arts kind, well, Mars needs writers. Mars needs film artists. Mar Mars needs poets, you know, as the British poet Shelley said, poets are the legislators of mankind because, you know, culture is upstream of politics. Culture is upstream of, of uh, and therefore technology or, or, or uh, economics for that matter. Uh, and if you can spread the vision, nothing can stop uh, an idea whose time has come provided it has the right, right messengers. And, you know, this is one of the things the Mars Society tries to do. So, one thing you can all do is join the Mars Society. Um, we're going to have another conference in October in the United States, and it'll be either in Arizona or California. But even if you can't make it, it will be open to virtual attendance. So anyone can attend, provided you can put up with the time difference. Um, and uh, we also sometimes have European conferences as well. So you can find out more about the Mars Society at marssociety.org.